WSDQ Dunlap, WEPG South Pittsburgh, The Copperhead, WSDT Saudi Daisy, Chattanooga. The viewpoints expressed on Liberty Works Radio Network are not necessarily those of the network, its affiliates, or sponsors. This is Liberty Works Radio Network. Now live from coast to coast and around the globe, more real talk, the kind you want, on Liberty Works Radio Network. Okay, good evening. This is Thomas Freed on the Liberty Works Radio Network. This is the Truth Attack Hour, and we're back again this week for more study and review on the income tax system that we have. I uh, want to apologize for missing last week's session to the regular listeners. I unavoidable schedule conflicts. So, two weeks ago, during the show, we were discussing all of the elements in the tax that uh, make it problematic within the United States, how it divides the population and creates all sorts of problems engineered through a class warfare that is created by the tax brackets within the system. And during the lecture, I talked briefly about the past application of the tax and how it's been misapplied and misused by the federal government to create that division within the population rather than to represent it as a whole. And this week, um, we may review that again at the end of the show. We'll see. I'm working from a set of notes this week that are a little disjointed. I'm going to try and keep the line of reasoning straight as we work through this, but I wanted to talk a bit about the enforcement powers behind the income tax this week. And uh, before we get started on that, I want to point out that two weeks ago during the show, I issued a challenge to any attorney or federal judge in the country to call in onto the radio show and cite the text of the Supreme Court decision <clears throat> where the Supreme Court says that the income tax under the 16th Amendment is a direct tax without apportionment. And I would like to point out to the audience that as to date, we haven't heard from any attorneys or federal judges to tell us where the text of that Supreme Court decision might be found, because it certainly isn't in the Bruce Schaber or the Stanton versus Baltic mining cases that anyone has ever been able to show to me, and I've been talking to attorneys for 10 years about this. So, again, if there's any attorney or judge out there who can call in and read the text of the Supreme Court opinion where that declaration was made, i.e., that the income tax is a direct tax without apportionment under the 16th Amendment, we'd like to hear from you, because uh, that's not what the Supreme Court said in 1916, and that's not what the Congressional Research Service tells American citizens today when they make inquiry of the fact. So, opinion imposed in place of law is the very definition of tyranny. I would like to add to that challenge now to any attorney or judge, you should call in and tell me what statute contains the word liability with applicability to the citizens. You know, the, whole, the whole enforcement practice of the tax is hinged on liability for tax. Everywhere you look, in the lien statutes and the levy statutes, all of the enforcement actions are hinged on a liability for tax, or a person being liable. So the question remains, how is a person made liable for tax if there's no statute that specifies that person is liable, particularly where there are statutes that specify that certain parties are liable. How does anybody else become liable other than the party named in the statute? Again, any attorney or judge who can explain these things or cite the statute or cite the text, please call the show and let us know. America is waiting for your answer. So, that takes us to... How did we get so far off track? So before we get to discussing the enforcement powers this week, I wanted to quickly review the history of the income tax and its application. And that means that we're going to look at real quick or here, we're going to take a look at how the tax existed before the 16th Amendment, what the 16th Amendment actually does, and how the statutes implement what was tested in the 16th Amendment which, of course, if constitutional, as determined, that's what should be enforced. So we're going to look at these things and try and work our way up to the enforcement statutes uh, associated with the enforcement of the taxing power. 
Now, in 1911, and considering both the nature and the constitutionality of the corporate income tax legislation being tested by the court in the Flint v. Stone Tracy case, this is in 1911, before the enactment of the income tax, the U.S. Supreme Court held the act now under consideration does not impose direct taxation upon property solely because of its ownership, but the tax is within the class which Congress is authorized to lay and collect under Article I, Section 8, Clause 1 of the Constitution, and described generally as taxes, duties, imposts, and excises upon which the limitation is that they shall be uniform throughout the United States. Within the category of indirect taxation, as we shall have further occasion to show, is embraced the tax upon business done in a corporate capacity which is the subject matter of the tax imposed in the act under consideration. Okay, so what they're pointing out is that these income taxes were previously considered as excise taxes laid on corporate privilege. And there's a lot more to this. Uh, the tax under consideration, as we have construed the statute, may be described as an excise upon the particular privilege of doing business in a corporate capacity i.e., with the advantages which arise from corporate or quasi-corporate organization, or when applied to insurance companies for doing the business of such companies, as was said in the case, uh, in the Thomas case. The requirement to pay such taxes involves the exercise of the privilege, and the element of absolute and unavoidable demand is lacking if business is not done in the manner described in the statute, no tax is payable. If we are correct in holding that this is an excise tax, then there is nothing in the Constitution requiring such taxes to be apportioned according to population. And they cite a number of previous existing cases supporting that. So what we have here is the court clearly declaring that the income tax law being tested in the Flint v. Stone case, Tracy case in 1911, is legitimate and constitutional because the income tax is justified as an indirect excise. It's plainly held to be an indirect tax. In this case, Flint v. Stone Tracy, has now been cited so many times by the federal court since 1911, over 600 times is my understanding, that this case now stands as constitutional law in defining the legal scope of the excise taxing powers. Black's Law Dictionary cites the case directly. It states, excise taxes are taxes laid upon the manufacture, sale, or consumption of commodities within the country, upon licenses to pursue certain occupations, and upon corporate privileges. And then Black's Law cites this Flint v. Stone Tracy case. In Flint v. Stone Tracy, it's even clearer. Excise, excises are taxes laid upon the manufacture, sale, or consumption of commodities within the country, upon licenses to pursue certain occupations, and upon corporate privileges. The requirement to pay such taxes involves the exercise of the privilege, and if business is not done in the manner described, no tax is payable. It is the privilege which is the subject of the tax, and not the mere buying, selling, or handling of goods. And I would add, it's not the mere earning of income that is the subject. It's the privilege of doing business in the corporate form. The tax is measured by the income. The basis of the tax is the corporate privilege enjoyed through the, federal, through the incorporation. The basis for the holding in the Stanton ruling, that the federal income tax is an indirect tax and not a direct tax, is, of course, now obvious and irrefutable. It is based on the factual understanding that the federal income tax had repeatedly been upheld to this point as a legitimate and constitutional exercise of the indirect federal powers to tax in the form of an excise under Article I, Section 8, Clause 1, far before the adoption and ratification of the 16th Amendment. And uh, <clears throat> this had been done essentially since the Civil War in the 1860s when the first uh, income taxes were imposed on federal officers in the form of a duty, and later again, uh, well, uh, later in the 1860s, uh, it was imposed uh, as uh, excise as well. So you had the ta income tax being applied since the 1860s as various forms of the indirect taxing powers, never as a direct taxing power, 
And when the law tried to apply the income tax in a manner that appeared to be direct in 1895, the Supreme Court struck down that law as being unconstitutional in the Pollock decision. And uh, that basically confirms for everyone, Pollock, that previous to the adoption of the 16th Amendment, the income tax was not allowed to be applied as a direct tax without apportionment. It was classified as an indirect tax, and the basis of the tax was the enjoyment of some taxable privilege or participation in some taxable activity subject to the indirect taxing powers of impost duty or excise, which basically are the activities I just listed subject to the excise taxes, and any activity associated with the importation of foreign goods or earning of, of money under a foreign banner here in the U.S., which would be the imposts that are also indirect. So taxation of foreign goods, foreign activity, and corporate activity, all legitimate as an indirect excise previous to the adoption of the 16th Amendment. Let's uh, read this, too. Evidently, this is from um, Stratton's Independence v. Halbert, a case handed down in uh, 1913. Evidently, Congress adopted the income tax as the measure of the tax to be imposed with respect to the doing of business in corporate form, because it desired that the excise should be imposed, approximately at least, with regard to the amount of benefit presumably derived by such corporations. Okay, so the Supreme Court clearly has historically identified that the constitutional justification for the federal income tax is as an indirect excise tax imposed with respect to the doing of business in the corporate form or dealing with commodities or enjoying certain licenses. But uh, otherwise, it's strictly indirect previous to the adoption of the 16th Amendment. And this is repeated over and over and over in court decisions. The Act of 1909 avoided this difficulty by imposing not an income tax, but an excise tax um, upon the conduct of business in a corporate capacity, measuring, however, the amount of tax by the income of the corporation. And that's uh, from Stratton. It's a case called Stratton. I don't have the whole thing here. It's well, Stratton's Independence Limited versus Halbert, 231 versus 339, 1913. Again, all of these Supreme Court sessions uphold the taxing power, the power to tax income, as an indirect taxing power. And uh, this then leads us to the option of the 16th Amendment. Now, what did the 16th Amendment do? Did it change that? Did it allow for the taxation of income directly? And we've analyzed this before, and I've pointed out that the 16th Amendment does not actually contain the word direct in describing the tax that is authorized under the amendment. And that if the word direct is added interpretively to the application of the amendment adopted by the courts, they effectively, through the adoption of the addition of the word that isn't there, engineer an inherent contradiction within the Constitution with pre-existing clauses in Article I prohibiting that combination of circumstances, i.e. a direct tax without apportionment. So, does the 16th Amendment allow the federal government to begin taxing the citizens directly, as the courts hold it does today and they're practicing, or does it not? And what are the ramifications of allowing the courts to s operate as though the tax is a direct tax without apportionment? Is there another way to address that erroneous argument and exposing it as being without foundation in law or at least in enforceable law? Okay? So, uh, We've talked a little bit about, I'm not going to run through here, uh, well, why don't we go ahead and do a little bit of this. After the 16th Amendment was passed, of course, it was immediately challenged in the courts, and there's lots and lots of evidence here to show, to prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt, <clears throat> that the courts are not upholding the proper ruling in this, but have reversed it. Okay, we'll be back in about five minutes. We're coming up on a commercial break here. I'd like to encourage everyone listening to support the Liberty Works Radio Network. We need your help to keep the fires burning and the information going out. 
We'll be back in five minutes. This is Thomas Freed. Truth Attack Hour. This is Thomas Freed, the Liberty Works Radio Network on the Truth Attack Hour. And today we're looking at the enforcement powers associated with the application of the income tax uh, under the 16th Amendment. And the first thing we looked at was that the tax, the income, power to tax income, had been upheld as a constitutional power previous to the adoption of the 16th Amendment in 1913. It had been repeatedly upheld as a constitutional exercise of the indirect taxing powers, either in the form of impost duty or excise. And then, of course, we have the 16th Amendment, and ever since then, or rather since the mid-50s and the 60s, through a series of lower court decisions that are actually in rebellion against the true Supreme Court holding and in rebellion against the Constitution system of limited government, the holding of the Supreme Court has actually been reversed. And the courts today openly argue and write the 16th Amendment authorizes a direct, non-apportioned tax upon United States citizens throughout the nation. And, of course, this is a complete reversal and represents a communistic application of a tax more akin, tax more akin to the second plank of the Communist Manifesto than any form of constitutional taxation, indirect or direct. So did the Supreme Court actually say that in the Brashaber decision? You know, there was a lot of arguments and a lot of confusion, and the court addressed this. But the court actually specifically rejects the argument that the circuit courts uphold today. And that's clear. We can see that in the decision where it states, we are of opinion, however, that the confusion is not inherent, but rather arises from the conclusion that the 16th Amendment provides for a hitherto unknown power of taxation, that is, the power to levy an income tax, which, although direct, should not be subject to the regulation of apportionment applicable to all other direct taxes, and the far-reaching effect of this erroneous assumption will be made clear. Now, you can see that when a judge cites this section, he's ignoring the part about the erroneous assumption. The court is saying that all this belief that it creates a direct tax is an erroneous assumption. It is rejecting the argument. It's not upholding it on that basis. It's rejecting the argument. It's not accepting it. In the very next case, the Supreme Court proves beyond the shadow of any doubt whatsoever that the court actually rejected the claimed argument that the 16th Amendment authorizes a direct taxing power. In Stanton v. Baltic Mining, the case handed down consecutively after Bruce Schaber, addressing again the power to tax income, this time in a corporate capacity on corporate mining operations, the court writes, by the previous ruling, it was, well, it was settled that the provisions of the 16th Amendment conferred no new power of taxation, but simply prohibited the previous complete and plenary power of income taxation possessed by Congress from the beginning from being taken out of the category of indirect taxation to which it inherently belonged. Now, the court here is telling you that the effect of the 16th Amendment confers no new powers of taxation, but simply reaffirms the power to tax income as an indirect taxing power. And that is, of course, because to engineer an interpretation as a direct tax without apportionment is to engineer an inherent contradiction with the Article I clauses prohibiting that combination of circumstances, i.e., Article I, Section 2, Clause 3, where it says representatives and direct taxes will be apportioned amongst the several states present in the Union, and Article I, Section 9, Clause 4, where it says no capitation or otherwise direct tax shall be laid in less in proportion to the census or enumeration here and before required to be taken. You cannot use the 16th Amendment to destroy those still existing protections from direct taxation. And that is what the circuit courts are trying to do, but that is what the Supreme Court rejected in its argument. And the fact that the American public is ignorant of these facts is the reason why they're made subject to this communistic form of the tax. And becoming aware of these facts and knowing this information is your path to freedom, i.e. the keys to the castle. So, is there any other evidence in this Bershaber decision that this 
decision is upholding the tax as an indirect application of the tax. And there sure is. In the first sentence of the case, the court writes, the appellant filed his bill to enjoin the corporation from complying with the income tax provisions of the Tariff Act of October 3rd, 1913. Now, what's a tariff act? That's an act that has to do with a foreign tax on imported goods or on foreign activity occurring in the United States. They're testing a tariff act. This Bruchaber case is testing a tariff act. And the appellant filed his bill to enjoin the corporation from complying with the income tax provisions. And what they were complying with was a requirement to withhold the tax as a tax collector, the same way that a store is made the tax collector in a sales tax system. So, is there any evidence in today's legislation of Subtitle A, the body of law that was enacted as the federal income tax in 1913, that this tax is actually limited to the collection of federal income tax from foreign persons and foreign activity? And indeed, that's exactly what we find in the statutes, isn't it? When we examine the authority of the tax collector relied upon in Subtitle A, the withholding agent, as opposed to the employer who was relied upon in the statutes of Subtitle C, which are the employment taxes, which weren't enacted into law until 1945, what we find is that the withholding agent is entirely different from the employer. The withholding agent doesn't withhold money from everybody he does business with like the employer does. The withholding agent only is required to withhold from a certain specific group of persons who, it turns out, are all foreign. And having collected the tax from the payments being made to those foreign persons who are subject to the tariff, the foreign duty, it is then those tax collectors, the U.S. parties making payments to foreign persons and withholding money from those payments being collected as tax, it is then those tax collectors, those withholders, who are given the liability and statute for the payment of the tax the same way that only a store is made liable for the payment of the tax that it has collected. And just as when the store fails the duty to collect and pay the tax, it is not the customer who gets punished. When the withholding agent fails to collect and administer to the collection of the income tax, it's not the general population that gets punished. It's the withholding agent, the tax collector. And the tax where it can't be collected from a citizen can't be owed because it's only owed by the tax collectors, the same way that a sales tax is only owed by the stores. So the court even tells you in the decision that the act provides for collecting the tax at the source. That is, makes it the duty of corporations, etc., to retain and pay the sum of the tax. Now, this shifting of the burden to pay the tax from the person earning the money to the person making the payment, where the person who pays the tax doesn't actually pay any money out of his pocket because he withholds it from a payment owed to another person, and then just turns over the money that he's taken from the other person, that's a shifting of the burden of the tax from the tax collector to another party, and that's a classic indication of an indirect tax, just like the sales tax. The customer has no interaction whatsoever with the government, only the store. It's the store that is entirely responsible for the payment of the tax. And this is a classic scheme of taxation for implementing an indirect tax, and this is precisely the scheme of taxation we find implemented in the statutes of Subtitle A of Title 26. Subtitle A, again, is the body of law enacted in 1913 as the federal income tax laws. Subtitle C, the employment tax laws, that are an entirely different set and body of laws enacted 31 years later in 1945, where no new tax is imposed. The withholding authorities are altered and expanded to allow persons to volunteer for the withholding of the tax through the provision of a W-4 at work when they may, in fact, not actually be required to have those monies withheld from them. So that brings us to the topic tonight for the last third of the show, which is going to be um, the enforcement powers associated with. So how do we get so far off? 
Well, let's take a look at what the 16th Amendment says to start this conversation, and we're going to backtrack a bit into the history and then come forward again with the discussion. The 16th Amendment carefully and specifically gives the legislative branch of the U.S. government, i.e. the Congress, and only the Congress, the constitutional authority and charge to both lay and collect the tax on income that is authorized under the amendment. The amendment specifically says, Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived, without apportionment among the several states, and without regard to any census or enumeration. Again, we should note it does not contain the word direct, although it leads the reader to believe it's direct by addressing the relief of the apportionment clause and the census or enumeration requirements. And by relieving them of those two duties, it's easy to assume it is a direct tax. But if you do that, you forget the fact that these conditions being combined together, direct and without apportionment, and not laid into portion to the census, are still prohibited in Article One. And you're therefore using one law to destroy another, in fact, two others. And that's an improper use of the law. There's no need to do that here. These statutes don't really conflict with each other. These clauses of the Constitution are not in inherent conflict with one another. You have to add the word direct, which isn't there to your interpretation in order to get to this effect of using one to destroy the other. This is an entirely erroneous and entirely improper use of the statutes that will do nothing but engineer and create chaos in society, because that's what happens where one law destroys another. You end up with chaos resulting from the fact that there is no law. Because law destroys law, and there are no protections other than the barrel of the gun in the end. So, this rebellion within the courts has to be terminated, or it's going to be the end of the American society. Because where you have a foundation split in two, a legal foundation, a constitutional foundation engineered through the inherent conflict, you have a society split in two. And a house divided can't stand. United we stand, divided we fall. We have a split house because of this rebellion in the courts, operating communistically to socialize the country under the 16th Amendment, doing so fraudulently, where the court rejected the arguments that it's direct and insisted that it was indirect. Well, this amendment plainly states that it is Congress that is authorized to collect the tax. And therefore, it is the Congress that must do so for any collection actions to be constitutional. Congress is not authorized under this amendment to abdicate its specific constitutional charge to collect the tax. Congress can no more pass its constitutional duties and charges like this to collect the income tax to the other branches of the government, like the executive branch, by writing law to effect that end, then they can write law that would allow the president to author law for the nation on his own in place of the bicameral Congress that is solely authorized to do so in the Constitution under Article I, Section 1, Clause 1. Congress cannot lawfully or legitimately pass its constitutional authorities and charges, like the one to collect the income tax, to any other branch of the government, like the executive branch, as has unlawfully been done in America. Uh, that authority is plain and clearly granted exclusively by the Constitution to only the Congress as the legislative branch, and it is plainly not granted thereunder to the executive branch. Under the doctrine of the separation of powers between the three branches of the federal government, the executive branch of the U.S. government is not constitutionally allowed or authorized to usurp the congressional authority of the legislative branch, where authority is exclusively granted to only Congress, as in under the 16th Amendment. So... How is it possible for the IRS, which is under the Treasury, which is part of the Cabinet, which is part of the Executive Branch, and the Justice Department, which is under the Attorney General, which again is the Cabinet level and under the Executive Branch, what we have here today is the Executive Branch enforcing the income tax in place of Congress. How did we get there? That's what we're going to look at in just a moment. Looks like we're coming up on the break here again. We'll be back in five minutes. This is Thomas Freed. 
with uh, Liberty Works Radio Network and the Truth Attack Hour. And again, if there's any attorneys or judges out there listening, do we have any? Okay. We're back. This is Thomas Freed with the Liberty Works Radio Network and the Truth Attack Hour. And today we're examining uh, the enforcement authorities behind the application of the income tax as practiced by the courts. And again, I just read the 16th Amendment, and I want to point out that the constitutional authority uh, granted for the collection of the tax and the legal charge to Congress under the plain and clear language of the 16th Amendment is for the Congress to exclusively enforce the collection of the income tax and not the executive branch of the U.S. government who was given absolutely no authority whatsoever in the 16th Amendment to correct anything, nor is it given any authority in any other part of the Constitution. So, how do we get to the situation we have today where it's not the legislative branch, the Congress, but it's the executive that is performing the enforcement of the tax? Well, that's done because it's been well settled that Congress may delegate its authority to executive agencies. And Congress does this delegation in statute. And if, and, uh, if you recall, I've shown that previous to the adoption of the 16th Amendment, the income tax had been sustained as an indirect taxing power out of Article I, Section 8. Now, how does, again, in Article I, Section 8, it also states, just like the 16th Amendment, that Congress shall have power to lay and, impo- lay and collect taxes, impose duties, and excises. So, again, how does the authority given to Congress to collect the tax pass to the executive? And that happens through the enforcement clause that's part of Section 8 of the Constitution. And it says, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, this is the enforcement clause for the Section 8 powers, including the power to tax indirectly. And Clause 18 says, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. So, this enforcement clause allows Congress to write statutes that let the executive, the IRS, and the Justice Department, enforce the collection of the income tax where it's imposed as one of the Article I, Section 8 taxing powers as an imposed duty or excise. But this enforcement clause in Article 1 has no applicability to any direct tax without apportionment, because that's not one of the foregoing powers referenced in the clause that the Congress is empowered to pass by statute to the executive. That's not one of the powers that's here. The power to tax directly is not an Article I, Section 8 power. That's prohibited unless apportioned. So this enforcement clause applies to the application of the income tax as an indirect tax on the corporate capacity or as a tariff or as a duty on federal officers or as a foreign tax. But it doesn't apply or pass any authority to the executive with regards to the application of a direct tax. And it is certainly not settled that Congress can delegate any authority that it does not actually possess under the Constitution and its amendments as written. Now, if you remember, uh, the the, the federal government also uh, argues that um, specific statutes Authorize it. I guess we're going to skip that part uh, and get right down to clearly no branch uh, the U.S. government can pass or transfer or delegate its specific constitutional duties or authorities or powers to another branch of the government to exercise in place of the true and rightful constitutional possessor of the powers, as we pointed out that. Uh, well, here. And just as clearly, no branch of the U.S. government can pass or transfer or delegate duties that it does not itself possess to pass or delegate. There can be no legitimate delegation by Congress or any other branch of the government of any legal powers <clears throat> that do not actually exist and are not actually possessed 
by Congress or that other branch of the government that do not exist by Congress, um, are not actually possessed by Congress under the Constitution to be delegated. They can only delegate that which they possess. So they possess a power under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, to enforce the income tax as an indirect tax. Okay, but as I pointed out before, Congress, there are certain things Congress can't pass over to the executive, like the power to write law. Uh, additionally, no legitimate authority to delegate powers to other branches legitimately exists where those powers are not actually granted under the Constitution or its amendments. Within the 50 states, Congress cannot write or enforce laws that violate the specific and clear provisions of the Constitution, nor can it write law to enforce an alleged authority for which there is no power granted by the Constitution to enforce that specific alleged authority. Now, as far as the 16th Amendment is concerned, there's no enforcement clause. No enforcement clause exists in the 16th Amendment, giving Congress the necessary constitutional authority to enforce by appropriate legislation or pass to the executive branch of government, i.e. the IRS, the power to enforce by appropriate legislation. The provisions of the 16th Amendment and or any allegedly new <coughs> taxing power allegedly created under the amendment rather than being a pre-existing uh, rather than the pre-existing authorities founded in the indirect taxing powers that are granted under article 1 section 8 to tax by impost duty and excise that are enforced under the enforcement clause provided by article 1 section 18 uh, that existed before the adoption of the 16th amendment well, on the other hand, enforcement clauses plainly do exist in Amendments 13, 14, 15, 18, 19, 23, 24, and 26. These amendments to the Constitution are dated both before and after the application of the 16th Amendment, plainly showing the intent of the authors of the 16th Amendment to intentionally not empower the Congress to enforce by legislation any income tax under the 16th Amendment, but instead forcing the Congress to, to rely on the existing enforcement powers granted under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 to enforce the indirect taxing powers are to enforce the income tax as one of the indirect taxing powers that are granted under that Article Section 8, Article 1, Section 8. Now, why do the lower courts blatantly ignore this intentional constitutional omission of an enforcement clause from the 16th Amendment as written and adopted, and pretend that a new constitutional enforcement authority now exists under the amendment to authorize the enforcement of the application of the income tax as a direct tax without apportionment, an alleged new taxing power created under the amendment, when no such enforcement authority can actually be shown to be granted under the Constitution or the amendment. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 of the Constitution is the enforcement clause for the indirect taxing powers granted under the Constitution in Article 1, Section 8, granting all enforcement powers necessary for the Congress to enforce the Article 1 taxing powers granted thereunder, i.e., to lay and collect taxes, impose duties, and excises. Uh, so, we see that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18 provides the enforcement clause that allows Congress to pass its collection authority to the executive, to the IRS, to collect the indirect income tax. But, there is no such enforcement clause in the 16th Amendment that would apply to any allegedly new taxing power created under the amendment, like the claimed new power allegedly created by the amendment through the erroneous decisions of the lower courts that claim it is a direct tax without apportionment. Well, if it is, then there's no enforcement clause to enforce that new taxing power. There is no such enforcement clause providing any enforcement authority at all that exists in conjunction with the 16th Amendment's alleged grant of power for Congress to tax income allegedly directly and without apportionment under the 16th Amendment, 
because there is no enforcement clause as part of that amendment, and that power to tax directly and without apportionment the people would be a new power that isn't enforceable under the Article I Enforcement Powers Clause. Now, the absence of an enforcement clause in the 16th Amendment constitutionally disables the executive branch from attempting to enforce the tax as a direct tax without apportionment in the courts, as it's been doing for over 80 years, or 70 years, since 1945. Because there is no enforcement clause as part of the 16th Amendment's adoption, the Congress is not given any power or authority under the Constitution or that amendment to pass or enact any legislation or to use any statute to enforce the amendment's direct income tax. It's a new taxing power. As a direct tax without apportionment, it's not covered under Article I. And therefore, since the courts insist that the income tax is a direct tax without apportionment created under the 16th Amendment and is not an exercise of the indirect taxing powers, labeling that claim frivolous, well, then the power to collect the income tax as a direct tax without apportionment cannot be enforced by any law or body because that power does not exist as a grant of power given to Congress in the amendment, being specifically and intentionally omitted. And therefore, certainly no power can be transferred or delegated to the executive branch of the government by the legislative branch to act upon to enforce the tax as a direct tax without apportionment. Congress, i.e., Congress possesses no true identifiable applicable authority to delegate any enforcement powers with regard to any direct tax laid without apportionment under a new authority created by the 16th Amendment. That power to enforce the collection of the income tax as a direct tax without apportionment cannot be legitimately exercised by the executive branch of the government, the IRS or the Justice Department, because the power does not exist as a granted power to be exercised under the Constitution by any branch of the federal government and therefore cannot be the subject of any statutes and cannot be legitimately delegated by either the Congress or statute or through statute to effect a constitutional exercise by the executive enforcing the direct tax. That is the specific intended legal effect of the 16th Amendment's author's intentional omission of an enforcement clause from the specific language of the amendment amending the Constitution in 1913. It disables any claim of the government to enforce the new income tax as a direct tax without apportionment. That's the effect of the absence of an enforcement clause. Congress cannot pass or delegate a power that it does not itself possess and is not plainly given by the U.S. Constitution. Delegations of authority can be held unconstitutional. The Supreme Court specifically held that a delegation of authority was unconstitutional in the ALA Schechter Poultry Corps versus United States case in 1935. The specific grant of congressional enforcement powers made through the adoption of a very specific enforcement clause that is adopted as part of the amendment to the Constitution is included in all of the amendments to the United States Constitution where that enforcement power was intended to be granted and deemed a necessary part of the amendment. <clears throat> the language used in the amendments where enforcement clauses included is quite plain and clear. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. This language is used with slight variations in Amendments 13, 14, 15, 18, 19, 23, 24, and 26, again, both before and after the 16th Amendment. If it was intended to be included as an enforcement power, if there was intended to be any enforcement powers included as part of the amendment, there would have been an enforcement clause. The intentional omission removes the enforcement authority of any new power alleged to be created which, of course, is exactly what the courts are doing. They're alleging a new power to tax directly, and then they're using the enforcement clause of Article I, covering indirect taxes, to allege the enforcement of the direct tax allegedly created under the 16th Amendment. They're actually bereft of authority to do that. Okay, looks like we've used up the time for this week. Maybe I'll do a little bit more on this next. This is Thomas Freed. From the Liberty Works Radio Network, this is the Truth Attack Hour. Didn't I hear that music?